Wednesday, December 1st, 2021, 6.18 p.m. This uh, Board of Commissioners workshop is called to order. City Clerk, will you call the roll? Mm -hmm. Mayor Hendricks? Here. Vice Mayor Price? Here. Commissioner Hodges? Here. Commissioner Andrews? Here. Commissioner Hudson? Here. First is public comment. If there's anyone that would like to make any comments on anything that is not on tonight's agenda, please step up to the podium, state your name and address. You have three minutes to speak. Again, that's anything that is not on tonight's agenda. Okay. Okay, topics for discussion. I know there are a couple of changes we need to make so that we can get some things, uh, get some folks. Yes, Mr. Mayor, if, if we may, if we can move I up to the uh, first topic and H to the second topic. Okay. So let's uh, let's go ahead and go with um, item one. Then we'll be adopting professional services agreement for undergrounding utilities. Uh, Director Webfer. And if I may, why uh, uh, Megan's walking up? The uh, obviously the undergrounding project we've uh, we did a um, memorandum of uh, understanding with the county, uh, and our portion is roughly 4.5 million that we were being allocated for the project. I think it was 4.4 something, uh, and um, you know, so what we have done already is contacted Duke and they're working on the engineering and hopefully we'll have an update here shortly uh, as to the completion because it's it's been almost a year, I think just short of uh, a month maybe of it, uh, in reference to that. So it's, it's a longer process, but you know we have an opportunity to piggyback onto an agreement and uh, out of Indian Rocks Beach and we can, you know, both all three of the Reddingtons are uh, are going with this particular firm. They're here tonight, and if you like what you hear, and uh, I'll place it on the agenda for the eighth, and we can pass this agreement. So this is just a workshop. You can ask your questions, uh, and uh, I think you'll be quite pleased. Okay, and I think we've already used part of that pennies for Pinellas money on some of the undergrounding already. Correct. Well, this yeah. is four is pennies yeah. four is what they call. I'm sorry, yeah. Megan. This is what they call pennies four. So this is a new allocation. set of allocation of money. And it's so. 4.5? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I think it's it just right under 4.5. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm just going to introduce you guys to Mark and Tanya with Utility Consultants. They have um, a little presentation they'd like to go through with you. They're here to answer questions. Tanya knows how to work some grants. So if you have any questions on that, um, just let us know. Okay, great. And just for the record, it's four. It is four point five. I was correct. Four point five eight five six seven one. So four million five hundred eighty-five dollars and six hundred and seventy-one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Megan, and, and good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. We're excited to be in front of you. So just real brief, we want to respect your time, so I'm going to go real quick through this, but any point you have questions or like us to go back to a certain section, we're more than happy to do that. So um, as, as Robert alluded to, we are working on several projects um, here locally on the, um, on the island here in Pinellas. Our office is actually here in Pinellas. Um, um, born and raised in Florida and actually live um, up in Indian Rocks Beach, so we're close by as well. So this is kind of in our backyard and, and special to us. So our, our whole focus on our projects with our clients is just basically quality service. The um, you know, relationships are critical. Utility companies are equally critical because without having a good communication with them, sometimes that's some of the failures on some of these projects. Exclusive focus, our firm, about 90, 95% of our projects are all specific to underground conversions. And then our employees, um, myself, I've got Tanya here with me tonight. She specializes in some of our larger 
project management roles on some of our big underground projects. She's also, like Megan um, alluded to, she actually is involved with a lot of grants and helps some of the communities work within that. So it's a nice asset to have. And then, like I said, we're a local firm. Some of the projects, this isn't all of them, but Town of Longboat Key, you're probably familiar with. It's one of the largest ones on the west coast of Florida. It's $49 million. We're, we're doing the project management on that. It touches about 7,500 individual parcels, residential um, mostly. So it's a, it's a lot of impacts to residents. So it's important as you're working through a corridor, both businesses and residents, the considerations are being made to make sure that you protect their interest in the project. <laughs> Golf Breeze is about a $12 million project. It's up in the panhandle. Um, Indian Rocks Beach, you guys are probably intimately familiar with that. City of Bradenton Beach, we're doing some projects up there. They broke it up once based off of a state appropriations fund of $2 million. And then there's been some other grants that have issued some of their undergrounding. The um, town of Hillsborough Beach is over on the east coast of Florida, and we're helping them with some easements to kick off their undergrounding project. City of Destin is probably one of the state's largest projects right now. It's, it's upwards of 96, maybe $112 million undergrounding project up in the Panhandle, and uh, we're helping with them. And then, of course, the Reddington Beaches. The, um, the big goal that we have when we go to these projects is transparency. We feel it's real important throughout the process to let you know where we are, what we're doing. We don't like surprises. We know you have your constituents that are coming up to you and they've got questions. We like to be very straightforward with our approach and we want everybody to know. We have a sense of obligation to the city manager and city staff to make sure that we're reporting the status. We just we don't want any surprises for city staff because it's a bad reflection on us. So we like to have that transparency. Um, experiences, communication, um, you know, these are all critical to the projects. I think communication is probably one of the key to the thing. And then completion on all of our projects, I, my background is really heavy into utility involvement. Um, I was also involved with the high speed rail from Orlando to Miami. So, you know, the expectations, one of the biggest things we hear in a lot of these speech communities is getting the poles out of the ground. So right at the front of the planning of the project, we're focused on trying to get all that done as part of the project. So all of the projects that we're currently working on, we're not having any issues with that. And the communication companies are off ahead of the power company. Again, some of the projects I won't go through them in detail, but we provided a, a layout of that. It talks a little bit about the significance and some key highlights for those projects. I did want to mention um, Bradenton Beach was kind of a unique project with that appropriations. We had less than a year to build the project because once the governor signed it, the state didn't issue the signed contract into the Br to Bradenton Beach until October. But they said the clock started from the time that the actual mm -hmm. governor signed it. So we had to really go in there and expedite that. So we're happy to report that we actually finished it a few weeks earlier. But that that schedule for that type of project, and if you're familiar with um, Bradenton Beach, it's a very, very tight corridor and uh, very limited right away, similar to yours. Um, this is just really to kind of emphasize some of our larger projects. You know, you're going through a lot of people's parcels, and then here you're going to be going through the DOT corridor. There's a lot of sidewalk. There's, you know, you, you just got a lot of pedestrian visitor corridor. So it's important to assess the existing conditions before you get out there. So when you're done with the project, if there's a cracked sidewalk, things that get left undone, it's very important to make sure that that stuff was documented ahead of time, during, and at the completion so that you're holding us, the contractors, responsible for that work and it's not getting left undone. Utility design, we've worked with several. Um, we know that your design, I, I believe it's completed. We've, we've made a call out to um, Duke as well just to find out the status on that, but it was good that you guys already initiated. That's usually a lengthy process. It sounds like it's near completion, if not already. Same thing is true with the carriers. It's important. We're very familiar with those designs. We can make changes and tweaks as we go through there to make sure that we assess impacts before we get out there. It's basically planning, just to make sure before we go out there, we've got a clear path as to what, where we're going and where the equipment falls and getting that um, identified. We also know that the funding on these come through, you know, each year you get a certain allocated um, amount of those funds. This is just basically a schedule. What we try to do is tie the work schedule in with the budget so you can see the cash flow for the project. So a lot of these projects are sometimes they're bonded, um, they get, you know, sometimes they borrow up front. So what we need to do is make sure that we're making sure that the project progress ties with the cash flow coming in and out of the project so that, you know, a lot of times we have to go into the front of the commissioners and report quarterly or monthly and saying, here's where we are with schedule versus budget so that we know that we're tracking that throughout the project. So it's just a nice tool to have. Um, 
easements, directional bore. We're very mindful. Like I said, we're working on some pretty large projects that it's very heavily involved. So we understand the significance when you're working through a section, property, businesses, personal um, residents, to have a clear plan so you're not going back and forth to that same property multiple times, just having a very clear plan and um, you know, just making sure that it, it's identified and planned before you go. Staging, switching, switching is critical. We initiate that. That's basically once you've got the infrastructure in place and you've done the, the make ready to the equipment, having everything lined up so the poles can come out timely. And then we talked about staging with city staff, just making sure we've got a plan as to where we can put materials and that's part of the schedule. And then, you know, reporting and documentation is critical on our projects. We just have a nice time long so you can, we can always go back and find out where we were at any particular time. And we just basically, one thing that I like to do is just basically have some daily pictures of the activities. It's nice to have the history when you go back to it. And then, you know, just basically, um, like I said before, this is what, what we do throughout the state. Um, it's really our primary focus. We love what we do. Hopefully that carries through. I, I think our clients, one thing I didn't mention before that's probably pretty critical is a lot of the projects, the contingencies that were established for the project, we don't have one that we're working on now that we've tapped into the contingency. So we're very mindful of a budget and making sure that we fall under that. We kind of pride ourselves in coming in under that target. So um, for this particular project, it's a little bit different because you want to take advantage of as much of the corridor as you can capture within that budget. Um, but we're very um, in tune with that and understanding that you want to get as much as you can with that and, and make sure that you capitalize on that. So with that, I just wanted to, you know, come here and kind of share some of that. Like I said, I didn't want to kind of go through it briefly, not to go through anything quick, but just to respect your time and see if maybe we can answer questions and hear directly from you, maybe anything that we can help address. Okay. I'm curious, you do the construction yourself, you are actually doing the undergrounding or, or are you overseeing the undergrounding? I don't own the equipment on our projects. We do full turnkey and we also do oversight management. So each project's a little bit different. Some of the projects here in Pinellas County and some of our other ones, we do the full turnkey similar to this. We manage the construction operations. We do, however, um, use contractors that are specific to this type of work. They're, they're qualified, approved vendors through the power company. The difference in that is, is that you can, you can have a boring company come in and do that work, but having one that does the work for the power company, you find you make a lot of less, less mistakes because they're very familiar with how that all ties in. It's critical, so it just keeps you from having to come back. Not saying that boring companies aren't familiar with that, but we strictly go with power company um, contractors that we've used. We only have a handful that we use and that are approved. And um, with that, we just, like I said, we don't have change orders on any of our projects. The power companies don't typically have change orders because they do the same thing. They use their own in-house. There's a high standard of expectation for those workers. So that's why we, we do that same thing. So the contractors we do when we do the full turnkey, they're, they can, literally we can do everything from the pole removal. So, so here you would be subcontracting or you would be doing the work yourself? We'd be subcontracting. The whole project? Correct. Okay. We do all the management and oversight, but the, the physical construction of it, we do sub out. So, and somebody told me a little trick um, recently, and it's how all this, one of the ways this whole complex was built for $10 million was that the city can purchase, whether it's cable or building materials or whatever, and not pay any of the applicable taxes tax, and whatnot. Tax free. So, yep. um, something to keep in mind on. Yep. And we can do it any way so, you want. Yep. We will sit with staff and figure out what's the best way. We've got projects where we procure the contractor for the city. It doesn't matter to us. We're, we're full turnkey and we do it different ways. So it's whatever works for you each you know, whatever your vision and goals are is what we, we adapt our, that's one, I think, convenient thing with us is we got the ability to do it however it rolls out better for the cities. Well, certainly to get projects rolling along the beaches to where we have continuous work for whoever it is for a length of time till we finish all these cities up. Madeira Beach, I think, as I remember, we got, uh, we had an agreement here to go ahead and move forward and get this done because it only gets more expensive every year. Yeah, yeah. 
And to your point with contractors, we've only got two or three that we work with. We're very, you know, our reputation is very important to us. And uh, we don't, you know, we're, we're very specific on the contractors we use that have history with us on projects because if they're successful on those projects, that's the ones we want to work with. So. Uh, I've got a quick question. Um, it, Meg, do we have a map yet? Where, where's this, where's this going? I mean, it seems like it's, I think so the, the last time. The plan is to finish from 144th ish all the way down to John's pass. Okay. So all, all on Gulf Boulevard, Boulevard right? So mm -hmm. nothing inland yet or. Not yet. Okay. Cool. We'll work towards that. <clears throat> so is it done up on this end from 144th to 150? I, I think the definition of done is the problem. <clears throat> I was going to say because I drive along there and it'll. And that's so what we all use. talk. I'm sorry. Go ahead. One phase one was from 155th to 150th. Um, is it done the way that we want it to be done? No, the, there's still poles that are still up. Okay. Um, and then phase two is still in the works. Um, we've had several conflicts that we've been told with things under the ground or FDOT, <clears throat> um, but I've been told multiple times recently it would be done by the end of the year. But that's also something that they can help us out with as well, should we need. Okay. Keep in mind, I have a chainsaw, and I've been dying to use it. So I've got any <laughs> poles out there that I... I've got a truck, and I've been there before. So <laughs> <laughs> we're helping Reddington with that same issue. They've got a, You've probably gone through there and seen that, you know, the power, the way it works. So the power company, once they get done and their system's energized and switched over, if the carriers aren't off the poles, they're just going to cut them and leave them there. Then you're going to be waiting for the carriers. So that's what I was saying earlier. One of my big pet peeves, I want the carriers off before we get to that point. So we're right out the gate up front working with them. We've worked with them for years. Um, that's all I've done my whole entire career um, is work with the utility companies. So they're stretched thin. They've got a ton of stuff on the plate. It's just working with them, having that history. So you want to get them off the poles before you're into that process so it's seamless. Um, I don't, that's what I was saying on our projects, on our other projects we're working on, we don't have any poles that are still spanned by the carriers because that's, we're, we want to be on that day one. So we are helping Reddington get some of that um, cleaned up and out of there. If, if I may too, one of the things that Mark and I talked about the other day uh, was the possibility of, of, you know, expanding to other areas and, and locating grant funding um, and he's been quite successful with his firm on uh, uh, pointing us in the right direction or pointing other cities in the right direction of getting funding for undergrounding into the local streets. And I know one of the things we've looked at is 150th, you know, of, you know, finishing 150th off uh, next, which obviously isn't part of the the penny four dollars, but, you know, if we do a, a good enough job in keeping our costs down on this project, uh, you know, we might be able to, you know, get the county to let us use the remaining funds to, to at least help with the costs on a, on 150th and and maybe through some of the grant contacts that Mark has that you know that might be helpful in that regard. And Tanya, um, she she worked about 20 years up at the Pentagon, worked with project management, a lot of the utility companies as well. But she she helps us with grants, and I think there's we can use or allocate some of the money for the undergrounding to apply towards a matching type grant, but I'll, I'll let her come up in case you guys have. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of money floating out there, floating around out there. And, yeah. Know. So just so you know, so there's, we, I have a whole running sheet where I'm tracking different grants and things like that in their uh, application deadlines. But right now uh, FEMA has just been given a, a large sum of money uh, to distribute specifically for hazard mitigation, which undergrounding utilities is one of them now. Um, unfortunately, because of, Louisiana, this past hurricane season, as you may or may not know, they actually lost their main tower, and I believe it's still down. Um, it's been it's been a couple months now. So they had several residents that had to vacate because of that and not move back in. So because of that, the, the um, uh, federal funding has come down through uh, FEMA. They have an open application time frame right now. So we're going to be jumping on that for anyone and everyone that needs that for undergrounding. So, and the, the precedence has now been set as well. Um, you can look in the, the media. Uh, several coastal communities are number one on the list. Um, Panama City just received, received um, several million dollars just for undergrounding alone, as well as Jacksonville, Florida. So, 
you know, those are the uh, two two big cities, but the little ones are being looked at too. So they're all they're all on the radar. So sounds like we'll be gone for them. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Um, have you been successful in getting grants to underground utilities in residential areas? So I know a lot of the grants, they do not want the specific residents going after the grant. They do look to the cities or the communities to apply for them as a whole. Um, so we've, I haven't seen any specific, you know, it's not specific just to residential. It's specific to a specific city. Okay. So we're looking at the <clears throat> whole city, like Bradenton Beach is one of them. Um, we're not just looking at the main co- corridor for FDOT. We're looking at that and um, anyone that's in that corridor or, you know, right now they're looking at water mitigation as well, trying to do undergrounding and coordination with that. So it all kind of feeds in together. Okay. Um, also, our sidewalks along Gulf Boulevard, I think, are too narrow and lumpy and cracked and holes in the way and everything else. Um, is it possible to determine like exactly where those easements end and get our sidewalks as wide as possible in those areas? I mean, I don't know how many sidewalks you guys got to pull up to go down and over and back up again, but it sure would be nice to not have to go down single file or almost hit my bicycle on a pole or something. In some of the areas on our street, that's all, our main street. That would probably be a conversation we'd have to have with FDOT because they okay. own and maintain those sidewalks. Oh, do they? Yeah. Okay. Yep, on 150th and Gulf. Okay. And I was thinking Gulf, but yep. yeah. Vice Mayor Price, um, it's not legal to ride your bicycle on the sidewalk. <laughs> absolutely. It is. it is legal. It's absolutely legal as long as you have, a, as long as you're <laughs> able to tell people ahead of you that you're on it. As in a bell. I don't typically do that, but some areas I do. Okay. <laughs> so, so most of this we're talking just inside the sidewalk in the the yard of the resident or the the building is where you're going to place the cables. Correct. It'll go within the within the right of way. So we typically, it's rare that we go into to private property, with the exception of the equipment. Of course, there's there's times because of constraints with with the sidewalk width and in certain areas, we look at those locations to find out where those switch is going to go, where the transformer is going to fall. But as far as the conduit installation, not you know, not all the time, but I'd say a, a significant portion of the project is all typically within the right of way. And transformers are still on a pole or. Uh, no, we'll, we'll drop them on the ground. They'll, they'll be ground mounted. Um, but we do. What we'll do is, as soon as we get the drawings from Duke, that's where I was saying we can. Once we get the design, the design will come from the utility company. We can go in there and make adjustments and tweak it. We'll find out where do the, where what makes the most sense for that equipment to fall, so it's not impacting someone. So once we identify those locations, everything kind of ties into that. But typically, that equipment, because your right of way is so limited, will fall within a um, adjacent property wherever it might fall in the corridor. But we're, we're kind of mindful during the design to see what makes the most sense. You, what you don't want to do is go knock at somebody's house, and I don't like it there, and then go to the next. We pretty much look at where it really can only go, so we're not you know going back and forth between owners. Okay, and cross streets, we go, you're able to bore underneath, or we tear up the cross street, and then... We bore everything that we can. There's very few times that we'll open cut anything, so we're, you know, and to your point with the sidewalks, you know, the the pits are really the issue because you're going to, you know, dive in where you're doing the bore. We look at those locations beforehand to kind of see what's what's the most minimal impact um, to those areas. Okay, and for the information, um, people and things like that, are they able to... Do they use the same conduit or um, do you bury just a single conduit for the power lines? And if they do anything, they have to place it alongside or how does that work? We 
so it's it, it's not always a every situation is a little bit different, but for the for a large part, the the power company will put their facilities in, and then we put the communication in right behind that. Most of the time, we use the same bore pit, but there's a separation requirement, so you have to have maintain a separation. But you don't have to. What we try to do as much as you can on a project. It doesn't work everywhere. We'll bore all of it in one shot, so we don't have to keep going back to the same spot, closing down the sidewalk, doing the bore. So we'll get the communication in right behind them while maintaining that offset. But we try to utilize the same pit where we can just to reduce that. So it works most of the time, but not in every situation. That's something that we want to look at for Internet providers or anything. The city wants to, to tackle that themselves. Or I mean, that's one of the biggest complaints I hear from people is the lack of Internet out here. That's in the process right now with uh, Frontier. They're they're burying them as we speak. They're up north. I didn't know if they were coming down. They're in. They're at the beaches right now. Okay. Yeah, a lot of them are starting to employ some of the 4G advance mm -hmm. going into the 5G. So you're going to start seeing some of those poles. And then replacing cables and things like that, um, because I've heard that the lifespan of underground cables is not the same as the ones in the on the poles. Um, is that something that's easy to do or something that we're going to generate a lot of future costs? Well, power company, Will, you you won't as the city. Um, but basically, the, the short of that is actually the, the overhead lines have more exposure to the elements, the sun, the, um, you know, you have an aggressive environment with saltwater intrusion. So typically being underground and they're sealed off in, in the equipment, it, it, it doesn't get changed off. In fact, you're starting to see the credits are a little higher for the, you know, when you get your binding cost assessment for the power company, the Public Service Commission makes them provide credits based on the history of what their what their costs are for overhead maintenance versus underground. And every year we're seeing the credits are increasing because the cost to go underground is a lot less on the power company. So it's actually a benefit. But when they do need to change the line, if that were to happen, they just go from switch to switch or transformer to transformer. So it's no different than going aerial. It would be out and connected. So it, it really, they pull it through the same conduit. Okay. And if we are going to branch off into residential or side streets, is there something that we should be doing now when we do this so that that's easier later? The design, uh, Alec, you know, basically it, it's kind of incorporated in the design. The intent is that you're typically at an intersection picking up a point. So you either have a splice box or you actually have your equipment. So it's always, you can always pick up because a lot of our Bradenton Beach project is a perfect example because of the funding that they're getting. We're doing little pieces here and there. So they're all planned and tied in in the design so that they know the future section is going to need to be intercepted. So it's kind of the same thing. You could come at any point in time and pick up, a, like I said, if you get a grant for a road to be widened or, or improved, you can always throw the underground in and connect to that system. It's, it's not a, doesn't cost more or create more of a hardship and cost. Okay, thanks. What do you charge? Well, I think... I th well, what we do is we typically, uh, oh, it's a good question. So we're still using rates that we've used for the last five years because a lot of our, we don't really have much of a presence on, on the internet or anything. We don't really market. Um, it's it's kind of more of a word of mouth. We, we kind of grew organically and one community's heard about our work and they said, would you come do ours? So most of our contracts, we're still using those old rates. But we've never come back to any client and asked for more money. We go in there and we do it um, for what the cost of the project is. We work with the staff. I think our rates are, I would imagine, they're, they're pretty competitive, if, if not lower than most. But I don't know what everybody's rates are out there. But, you know, we, we typically on every project, we work with what your budget is. Well, you know, you, you can only build, you got your budget, what you can build it. We typically will work our hours to fit that and accomplish the project. So I don't think it would be an issue. I don't think we're high. So it, your fees would be paid for by our grant is the plan, right? It'll be the actual penny four dollars. So okay. it, it's a that's what one penny of the four, yeah right the, the money so, allotted to us for the project. Correct, okay. and and that's one of the nice things about a turnkey operation because it has less effect on public work staff, and uh, and they can come in and we hold one person responsible, and that's the gentleman at the podium. And, yeah, you know, so if something goes wrong, uh, either with a sub or something, you know, we go call and pester him. 
we're, okay. we're pretty transparent for what it's worth. We've already provided some of our current contracts. So like I said, we've got all those contracts. We're more than happy to share those rates and honor those rates. Um, and, you know, for all the other cities, they, they seem to work well. So, but, you know, we're willing to make the job successful for you. But we, we did that with Indian Rocks Beach. The contract and then the task orders are assigned once you get a little bit more because to prematurely figure out this is what it's going to cost you, you want to know some of the, the keys. So they typically break it up in task orders, one and two, two being the construction, one's the initial phase to get everything kicked off. So, you know, the hours are determined on what the need of the project. It sounds like Megan and, and staff have done some upfront work already. You don't need that. So, you know, yours will be a little bit different some, for some municipalities that hadn't started any of the process. So we work with, with city manager and staff to come up with what that budget and then they, you know, want to make sure it works. Okay. And, and basically by piggybacking off of Indian Rocks Beach, we'll be utilizing, uh, you know, the same, for probably lack of a better term, the parts list that goes into the, the particular task uh, the only thing that's going to change is, you know, we might need more of part A than Indian Rocks Beach, but it, we adopt, you know, what their costs are for each one of those parts. If I have that correct? You're right. So let's say Indian Rocks Beach, it's $20 a foot for whatever size cable. You just don't know how many feet of that you're going to need, but you know you're going to need that cable. So what we're what we're doing is saying, here's what we're charging them, which is a competitive rate that was negotiated you'd get the same rate. You just don't know what the linear foot's going to be yet. So once you have that, you, you can quickly formalize the number. As I was saying, you know, you get the, get it as, as cost efficient as you can, because really what you want to do is get as much of the beach covered underneath that penny four. Right. Okay. Any other questions? I guess. So what can go wrong with, <laughs> what are the, good one. Well, everything. <laughs> that wasn't the question. We'll just go back on the, the first two phases, and I can tell you what can go wrong. I think I think you you you've probably experienced it, but everybody that we we have come in behind other other companies, and um, I think the biggest thing that we hear is the poles didn't come out. We thought they would come out. We don't like them being cut, and the power companies left, and now we're 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 standing. We have these poles, and the whole reason we did the underground is because we wanted to get rid of the unsightly right. poles right. and lines. So what we can share with you is we just, you know, every job's different and I don't know the circumstances that may be, uh, there may be a good reason for that. We haven't experienced in that. And, and it's, I just don't like that. It's, I'd like to Bel Air beach. Um, you're familiar with that. We came in there and, um, you know, they, they had, um, I think it was three, three and a half months of coming in there, building the job and getting the poles out that included frontier. So I think it's just, I, no, no secret. It's just relationships. That's what it is. And just keep the relationships. That's really what could go wrong. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Uh, what we plan on doing is having, uh, I'll place this on the agenda uh, for the meeting on the 8th so we can continue to move through and we'll have some of those other documents for you. Okay. Anything else for me? No? I don't think so. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. Is there any public comment on this before we move forward? Okay, next is Fantasy Planet lease agreement and discussion. Uh, City Manager Daniels. Yes, I uh, was contacted by uh, Moises, our, our tenant that uh, has been in the Fantasy Planet uh, site for what about 15 years 30 years excuse me so uh, the short term lease. yeah the short term lease. <laughs> well it's been obviously renewed and come back before the commission uh, the buildings in a state where uh, it needs uh, several repairs that are the responsibility of the tenant and um, Moises has checked with the bank for funding for these uh, 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 repairs, you know, which include the roof, the air conditioning system, uh, electrical cabling and, and setups. So it's, it's going to revamp the whole building. They're probably going to be closed for uh, 45 to 60 days, roughly, I think is what uh, the estimate is. All he's asking for us is to, you know, take the current agreement, 
the bank is looking for a seven-year commitment on the lease uh, and and then uh, another five years as an option, which we he currently has. He's in he's in his fifth year, I think two years into his fifth year right now, uh, roughly. And then uh, I sent the lease over to uh, our city attorney, obviously, and uh, he's made some changes to the lease. And uh, I think everybody's in agreement that if that's something that uh, you would support, um, it's a little bit unique, but I think you know, he's, he's been a great tenant. Uh, I know since I've been here and I heard from, you know, individuals that were here in the past that, you know, he always pays his rent on time. And, you know, we, um, you know, obviously want to support a local business where we can. Tom, did you have anything you want to add? No. That's, I'm fine with that. And he's here. If you have any questions, he'll be here also next week because that'll be on our agenda for That's, next week. So. Move our charter forward. will allow that. You were going to check on that, whether our charter no allows. Problem with our charter was, I'm not sure if it was in the charter or something that you thought we couldn't extend more beyond a certain number of years. Well, I think that was 10 years, but we're... 10-year period of time. Yeah, we're seven years and, and five. That's 12. <laughs> well, but the five's not a automatic. He's right. got to come back and get your approval for the five-year lease. That's correct. Because I think 12 is a long time to... There's, so, an es there's an escalation clause every year. Oh, I know, I know. But I mean, so the option is not his option, it's our option. It's both. So, but he needs our approval if he wants to continue on the site. So it's, it's you know, we could always deny him, you know, if you think 12 years is too long and we need to do something else. So, you know, the commission at that time, you know, would be able to make a modification or, you know, come up with something else. Am I correct in that? So section 1.7 of your charter says the board of commissioners shall submit to a referendum vote of the electors of the city at an election to be called by the board of commissioners and shall require a majority vote of the electorate in favor before approving number one, the sale of any real property owned or possessed by the city or number two, the sale, conveyance, or lease for a term that exceeds 10 years of any land owned or possessed by the city. Only after a favorable referendum vote by a majority of the electors' votes cast may such a property interest be sold, leased, or conveyed, provided, however, that the city shall have the power to convey public utility easement without requiring referendum vote of the electors of the city. This lease is, is not for 12 years. This lease is until... Um, uh, September 20th, 2031. So it's a little under 10 years. <coughs> and so it meets that requirement. So you don't have to do the referendum. So this is seven years past the existing lease? No. That he's got three years on? Oh. Well, yes, it's seven years past the existing lease. That's correct. I think that's a long time to tie up that piece of property. We're planning to build a garage across the street and all that. I don't know. I don't have a problem with it. He's he's been in there quite a while. He's been a good tenant. Uh, it it increases every year. There's a clause in there yeah. to increase the amount. Yeah. Uh, as as long as we're okay to do it, I don't have a problem with it. I, as I understand, he needs to have that amount of time on the lease to be able to go to the bank and get a loan to do all the repairs that need to be done to the building. And I I understand that. I, what are we gonna do, put another t-shirt shop in there? I don't know if we need it for something else. I'm just... That's all. <laughs> I'll chew on it. Okay. I mean, we're not voting on anything tonight, but we're okay. Not. I got everybody's yeah. opinion. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> and that's why, you know, we wanted, didn't want to spring it right. on you at a meeting, and this way you have an opportunity to think about it. And, you know, and obviously, um, you know, uh, any modifications or whatever that are can be done legally. That's okay. uh 
Mr. Trask, as long as we're okay with it legally going by the charter. It's under a 10 year period of time. I'm fine with it. Yeah. Uh, so we can bring it back to the the uh, regular commission meeting and discuss it some more and then vote on it. Great. Okay. Is there any public comment on this? Okay. Next is addition to the Board of Commissioners Handbook Budget Amendments. Uh, Vice Mayor Price, I see your name on here. Yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted, I thought we'd do ourselves a favor if instead of getting budget amendments, like at the last minute, we're like the last meeting where it had to be done then, where we didn't have a lot of the explanation that, um, that we adopt these two, I guess, policies. If, if I may, I, uh, can I just suggest probably the, and, and Claire and I have spoken about this, probably the best place to put that is in the BOC handbook uh, because that dictates to, to us too sure. uh, what you need and when you want it and so forth. Um, are we in agreement, Claire? I don't want to speak well, for Well, I agree with that, and also I agree with um, Vice Mayor Price that anytime we're doing budget amendments, all staff should be aware of what's in there and have talked about it, and, and that way we can respond to commissioners' right, cause uh, we have questions, questions in the we meeting. No, and right. I think and at least by, we need to have it at a, at a well, the first one says that all budget amendments must be discussed at a workshop before it's sprung on us during a meeting. Yeah. yeah. And the second one says, <clears throat> I want, I want, since we're holding these directors' feet to the fire for their own budgets, obviously we need to make sure that they understand what's being asked, you know, because, you know, I, don't, I frown upon having to add money to people's budgets all the time, which we've done this quite a few times already this year. So I don't know. Something to look at and think about. I mean, Good I idea. think. Yeah, I, 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 I always thought this was kind of the procedure anyway, how, how it should be done. Um, bringing it up at a workshop, I guess it's just not written down anywhere. I mean, I, I think that we've traditionally, if there's been a, I know that the last one was just kind of the end of the year, moving some money around. But traditionally, if there's a big budget amendment, um, it'll be bought up at a at a workshop in order to be discussed, but it should be in writing. You're hundred percent correct. And, um, I, I, what's the second one read happy before the second one the, says before bringing the budget amendment to the board of commissioners, the director of each department requiring the amendment must approve it okay. and must be able to explain it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Like I said, just not written down anywhere. I, I would think that that would be mandatory anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, it didn't it, happen look, I, time, so. I I was on that side once. I had to stand there and, and go over budget amendments a bunch of different times, and um, it's not easy asking for more money when if no more, if you, if you're not replacing the money with additional revenue. So, well, and, and yeah, it worked out right because we had excesses somewhere else and blah right. blah blah. So I know we weren't making, and things are always going to be shuffling, right? Because you Correct. can't predict the future. That's no problem. But I just think that we should make this a practice. No, I think I think it's great, and I think you know the, the the one thing that we don't want to become micromanagers of each individual department on how they're spending money. I, I personally have you yeah. know when, once we assign a budget, um, it's pretty much up to Andrew and the individual department heads to to go through that budget. And if something changes, I mean, there's going to be mission critical things that come up during the year. I'm, completely okay if you want to change a project and push one back a year. I mean, that's, that's totally okay. That's your money to spend as long as it's not something, you know, that's controversial or something that, you know, we, we, but I don't think we need to approve every last dollar that goes in and out. And we, no. cause we're not, we're not going to stand over the top of them and do it. We're giving them a budget. We're trusting these, we're paying them good money. We're trusting them to be able to run their budget. If, something mission critical happens, if something unforeseen happens and we do have to add money to the budget, yes, these are the processes that definitely need to be 
um, be enforced in order to get that get new money out of this board. Right? I think that's great. No, it's it's very well written. And Thanks. it's not it's not like you must come before us and explain it. It's just you must be able to if if we have that question. You know? Correct. We just don't want to be blindsided with something once we get to the meeting and all of a sudden we got something in front of us that we didn't have time to absorb. Yeah. No, it looks, looks good to me. Yeah. And, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, but just one question I have, uh, just as I prep uh, Mr. Carson and stuff with our processes, but uh, I know we've always talked about, you know, similar to what, uh, you know, Commissioner Andrews said, you know, the, the budget is X number of dollars for this department. You stay within that budget. If there's an issue that comes up and we need to do a budget amendment because of an unforeseen expenditure or whatever, garbage truck goes down or, you know, you know, whatever we might have, that's when we come back before you. But at the end of the year, the main thing is that your, ba your budget balances out, that you're not over. Uh, you know, we could have line items that have gone over, but, you know, we, the manager or the department head takes that into account and makes sure that we have extra money in something else. Maybe it's another purchase that they wanted to do that year. But they're not going to do it because maybe the personnel costs went up high that, that year or whatever the case may be. So just so I have a, an understanding with you all, and, and that's what you're talking about, correct? Okay. Thank you. Andrew, I'm sorry. Sure. So on that note, I do have a, a budget amendment that I intend on putting forth to you all for the next regular meeting. Yeah. Shouldn't come as a surprise. That's to increase the building fund, building department's budget by the $125,000. That, that was for the acquisition of the Muni City uh, permitting code enforcement, et cetera, uh, web solution right. that they'll be implementing. And that's just a timing issue. So we had made a budget amendment actually in FY21 to accelerate that, thinking we could get that purchase consummated in FY21, but we were still going through the, the vendor vetting process and didn't get that done in 21. So um, that's we're, it's now happening in 22. So that's the cost for the budget amendment. Okay. I'd be, yeah, I was thinking that was 100,000 on that, or were there some other things? I think I'm, I'm making it 125 training. in case there's okay. unforeseen. Okay. Uh, additional costs from data conversion or other things that could that could occur. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. I think Frank came up and explained. He already gave the, the yeah, presentation. Yeah, we already had yeah. that out. Okay. It's just yeah, yeah, this formality at this point, just to okay formalize it into an amendment. By the way, I'm using that uh, my Madeira Beach app a lot. Good. Uh, and we gotta just get out there more often. I think we're talking. I know it's off the subject here, but we're talking about, you know, doing some Facebook live uh, settings, to, you know, with some of the residents and walking them through it. It's so easy and we just walk them through it right away and yeah. and uh, everybody else can get to know that. And we get even posted little videos on, on our website for or it. Or on YouTube. Yeah. Something to, okay. So good. Okay. Any public comment on this? No. Okay, next is, do uh, you want to do the beach groin since uh, they're here? I know Linda's probably going to shoot me, but uh, <laughs> we we have two gentlemen out carrier and, and uh, to talk about our beach groin project. Uh, sure. I guess that's C. I'm sorry. I should have yeah, asked you C. to move it before. Okay. Okay. Proposal for engineering and permitting for beach groin project. Director Webster, are they starting to the, install them tomorrow? I wish I could tell you that news, but um, <laughs> we're closer. I can give you that. Um, so I have Al Carrier and Joe Foster here to kind of go through the scope with you guys. If you have any questions, um, Joe and Al are working together as teams. Al's very aware of the beach groins and actually worked with them with the rehab in 2013. So if you have any okay. questions, here they are. Okay. I think some of this work's probably already done from years ago, isn't it? From um, 13. I wish I could say yes, um, but I'll, I'll get to that. So uh, 
Good evening, Al Carrier with Dolan Associates. Um, I did a little Google research to find out, you know, how the groins came about. And I did, found out in 1957, the city installed 37 groins. Um, I did also find out sometime back in the mid nineties, there was a restoration project, but there was no details of what had occurred with that restoration project. Then in 2013, the city went out there and did a project <clears throat> to kind of give the, the groins a little more life. And the purpose was the, the groins are made of these king pins that hold the panels together. And you've all seen those. And over time, the concrete has spalled off and there's rebar that was sticking up. So the city was afraid that the rebar, someone would go into it and impale themselves. So the city put out a, a contract, uh, actually a local contractor had won the bid and they jacketed those kingpin and put epoxy over the rebar. The whole purpose was that I was trying to get a little more life out of it till we could get to today. Um, today out of the 37 uh, groins, there's approximately 23, between 23 and 21 groins that are exposed at any given time. Basically from 137th Avenue Circle North, they're exposed at least partially. Everything south of 137th Avenue, from what I could tell looking through aerials and being in the community, they're completely covered in, in sand. So they're doing what they're supposed to do. You guys were awarded a FDEP grant for 1.75 million, that, congratulations. Um, that's a lot of money. The grant is to reconstruct the groins, not a, not a temporary fix, but a permanent fix. To give them another 50 year life. In your packages, there's a proposal um, for our services. Uh, Dolan Associates has teamed up with Joe Foster's group. Uh, Joe's a structural engineer. He uh, does also environmental permitting. He works all up and down uh, the East Coast of the United States and all over Florida. He's here to help us with the modeling and permitting efforts um, and can answer any questions you may have. The proposal is full service between the two of us. Uh, we're going to start off with pre-application meetings as soon as possible, and then um, work our way through the project all the way to project closeout. Ideally, um, we would start work as soon as early January with pre-application meetings. There's some uh, upfront work that we need to do, like surveys, uh, bathymetric and, and benthic surveys. We need to have the pre-application meetings with the, the staff of uh, Army Corps, DEP, Pinellas County, to determine what their requirements are going to be. We want to make sure that we can get that information um, to them before the start of the turtle season. So we really have a limited time here before we can do some intrinsic investigation on the beach. Um, we would like to have the permitting done throughout the summer and then start construction November 1st of next year. That gives us about a five month to six month window in between uh, the turtle season to get the work done. And with that being said, because there's so many groins, um, let me back up. In the, in the grant, it talks about 21 exposed groins. In the proposal, we're looking at doing 23. I want to make sure that we get them all, that we don't leave any of them hanging out there. And if for some reason it ends up being 24, it's, it's 24. We'll get the 24 permitted. Um, with that, if you have any questions, be more than happy to answer them. I guess I thought... I didn't know it was a matching grant. Are they all matching grants nowadays? I thought that 1.7 mil we could just use towards it and then us pay the difference, but I guess not. That's, I thought it was a, we paid 30%, but I also thought the figure on doing the groins that I had heard was like 1.2. I think it depends on the total extent when we're talking about totally rehabbing the groins and doing the, the jack is two for the longevity, the cost obviously goes up. Um, but originally, the, like Al had said, in the paperwork, it said 21. We do have, at any given time, 23 groins, um, and it is a 50% matching grant. So, and... And the estimated cost is 3.5? 2.5. So estimate, our estimated cost as of nine months ago, based on price of vinyl and everything, was 2.5 million. The grant was 3.5. The total grant was 3.5.
but we only got 1.75. Well, this right. this is saying DEP is the 1.75. Uh, local. Now, are you talking Madeira Beach local? So it's just saying that's another 1.75, and it says on here 3.5 million. That's what I've got. For the grid. Right. This is an estimated eligible project cost. I think what you're dealing with is the grant that's coming in is should be 50% of the cost. And if you double that, I think that's where you come up with the 3.5. Okay. Correct. Okay. I have a question. Um, so, well, first off, I didn't know there were um, growing south of 137. So that's interesting. And they're just buried after all these years. Huh? Wow. Um, what exact, are you guys going to kind of go through the same process as happened in 2013? Are we going to go out further? We're going to, so we're building. We're going to, we have a couple ideas. We've, um, Joe and I have talked about this pretty extensively and with his experience and what he's done in other places. Um, we have a pretty good idea what we want to do. We're, it, you're essentially rebuilding those, those growings. Um, I hate to give, you know, tell you exactly what we're going to do, but um, it's going to be rebuilding those groins. You're going to get another 50 or 60 years life out of those groins. Okay, but we're not knocking down the ones we're, we're not, we're, so no, we're not proposing to it. knock those down. So okay. basically I would expect you're probably looking at wrapping them in vinyl, vinyl sheeting and then capping it. Mm -hmm. So maybe a little bit more length and a little bit more height simply because of the process, if nothing and else. It, so some of those questions will be answered with the permitting agencies and it depends on the scour model and everything else that, that has to go into that of what needs to be done based on the way that the beach has grown over the years and yeah. recent models and that sort of thing. Yeah, and if we could extend the one on the south end, I know <laughs> Megan's got <laughs> I'm looking at catching sand so that it's not going into the pass. That big old groin out there. That big We're going to call it a groin instead of a jetty. <laughs> Just a game of semantics, that's all. <laughs> well, I think this is great. I mean, I think this is one of those projects that, you know, comes along well, once every 60 years, right? So uh, this is this is great. Hi, Al, by the way. It's good to see you again. I haven't seen you in a while. There it comes. Uh, I know you probably mentioned not, it before and I didn't write it down. What was the time frame on this as to how long it would take? If you start November 1st, it's going um, to take six months. Six months. Five to six months. And um, because of the, the size of the project, when we put this out to bid, we're going to have to be very uh, strict on the timeline and put penalties if they go beyond that six months. We would need to get a contractor in here that has multiple crews that can do multiple growings at one time to make sure we get it done before the start of this turtle season. Because okay. the last thing we want to do is prolong this thing for another right. six months and then you're, you're in 2013, right? So okay. and your cost you. will just go up too. So. Your cost will just go up then too if you prolong it. Correct. Well, that's why we can't, I mean, it's past time to kick this down the road. We got to get it done. So are we getting estimate quotes on this? I guess we have to, right? Well, let's and pick a contractor and all that good stuff or so right. we'll, we'll put that we'll put the uh, construction plans and specifications together we'll put the bid package together with megan's help then you're going to put this out to bid so contractors you're going to get the lowest or obviously the lowest contractor price that you can from the most qualified contractor right and that's that's how we'll we'll bid it out and they'll be prettier than that rusty Concrete. It'll be beautiful. Do you, do you know <laughs> that <laughs> beaches north of us want groins? I'm sure they do. Instead of beach nourishment. And by the way, these were put in in 1957. That's what he Before 1957, there were wooden groins out there. I did see that all the way back to, I think, the 30s. And they actually groins. went out and did a dog leg to the north. And they got buried. And no. then in the 50s, they came back and put those in no. beyond. So they work. They work so, here. Yeah. One thing to, to add, too, um, as, you know, is the ARPA funding becomes available, obviously, we, you know, we, we have ARPA funding now, which is the federal funding that we got. 
uh, and we get more next year. But there's also talk with these infrastructure bills that are being passed through Congress that uh, some of that money will come back to the local municipalities as well. So with this already being a project that we're moving forward on, we can have some help with that match as well because the ARPA funding can be used for matches and, and everything else. So, um, so it looks like, you know, again, it'll give us uh, a goal to uh, work on lobbying our federal legislators, uh, but I think some of the, you know, the, those situations we're going to have to be doing anyhow with some of this funding that's going to be yeah. coming available. Well, I, I understand from Representative Cheney also that there is grant money available that can be piggybacked on to the state funding we're getting. So, and I think you've talked to Linda a time or two, haven't you? I have. I've, I've filled out a few applications, but I have not heard back yet. Okay. So those are for our roadway yeah. projects well, as well. we'll just keep on, mm-hmm. keeping on and on. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. What do we have in our budget set aside for next year for this? I don't pretty know much we, have it. I'm sorry. I don't know if we've committed the ARPA funding as as yet. Have, I think that's the money that w- might be used, but I don't want to speak for Andrew. We did a revenue loss calculation. So what was the, the total from that revenue loss calculation we put in as, as grant revenues for FY22 and you have significant latitude on how you can spend it. So if worst case scenario, to kind of answer the question, I think if we had to come up with 1.75 million, would be able to do that out of the current ARPA funding that we have? In one fiscal year or multiple? No, it, it's going to be over two years, you know, that we're doing this. November of 22 to April, April of 23. Mm-hmm. Or a different budget year. Yeah, yeah we would be so in 2023, 20. the budget years. Well, it'll be our year. It'll, it'll be, be 2023. 2023. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, let me, I'll check what we. What I we thought you got like 800,000 this time. That sounds about right. Let me pull that up real quick. Because I mean, I think cut out of this 193,000, a lot of that will come in the 2022 year. All the engineering work and things, permitting right. things like that, will all be in the first part. So, do we have money in the twenty in the current budget? Right, and we do have that money that we've gotten from the allocation from the state. Uh, so that'll be coming in. Uh, but again, it's a reimburse a reimbursement uh, situation. So we spend the money, similar to what we're doing with the underground, and we spend the money turn in the receipts, and then they pay at certain levels of the project. We've got $1,077,000 uh, for available, available for FY22, and that's that. half the tranche. <laughs> okay. Thank and you. And hopefully the, um, the bids will come back much lower than... Yeah, we're hoping to give them quite some time to be them, able to... Yeah, get them out of dogfight with each mm-hmm. other. So, and and uh, I think there's grants that you can use for the engineering on this also, Megan. You might. I will check into that. Okay, dope. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Any other Stop questions? On that, right, Jenny. Yeah, it's a, thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. Did you open that to the public? Beg your pardon. Did you open it up to the public? That's what I was fixing to do. Okay. Is there any public comment on this? No, thank you. I don't think we have any, but yeah, but people on TV don't know that there's no one in the audience. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Okay, next is update of community okay. planning process and activity center <laughs> land use proposal, Director Portel. Thank you, Mr. Mm-hmm. Mayor, Commissioners. As you know, uh, we've talked before about the discrepancies we have in land use and just the inadequacy of our plan to really um, cover what we have in the city and also um, what we would want the future to bring in order to um, design a fully financially and economically resilient 
future for us as well. Um, and so we need to uh, come back with an update to our comprehensive plan and also propose change to the county plan to, to give us the plan we really need. And in order to do that, we initiated a public hearing um, and community information input process. Um, to remind you, we currently, this is the, um, you the, the red, for instance, this is the county's land use distribution in their plan for us. And a couple of things you'll notice is that um, although Pelican Lane in the blue area, which is resort, is pretty similar to what we have in our plan, there, um, when you see the comparisons in the chart there, the um, retail and services, which is the red, is particularly under um, designated for John's Pass at a 0.55 floor area ratio, that means that you could use just over one half of your, your lot, even with a one-story building. Of course, we don't build one-story buildings here. Um, and um, that's, a, that's a big problem. I also want to draw your attention to the little spots of green there, because we don't want to cause any alarm about doing this. But for some reason or the other, in the county's plan, um, and then it got carried over into ours over time, there were some easement spaces and just a gap between the back of some lots and the coastal construction control line that the city or the county designated for open space and rec behind other people's property, even though our code says that when, when the parcel falls short of the construction control line, we use the construction control line as their back lot line setback. So um, it's, it's inappropriate for us to have public open space um, sandwiched between the the beach and those, we, we, we can't um, maintain it as recreation space. Um, and then the one in the middle of the development, the red over there is an easement for uh, utilities. And that's not typical that you would give it its own land use as recreation. So we're just gonna recommend giving those a proper land use. It doesn't change their use. If it's an easement, it's an easement, but it should have the proper land use for its surrounding property. But you can see that there are some discrepancies there that are pretty significant. Um, this is to give you an idea is, um, let me show you here, the hatched area is the activity center area that we are recommending um, would be included in the activity center. Okay. And it includes areas, you know, we don't always consider things outside of the village complex here as being part of it, but realistically these things all integrate in terms of traffic and pedestrian back and forth. And this provides the residential and tour support for the activities here. And the better we integrate those, uh, the safer we all are and also the better businesses at, at the pass. So, um, this is some of the material, I'm not going to go into complete detail, but some of the material that deals with the history of John's past, and it's really important that we try to make the county understand, um, because a lot of times, historically, people refer to John's past as being an old, quiet fishing village, um, which actually, historically, is not the case. There were certainly portions of it that were kind of village, like in terms of the boats that come in and people staying there on the weekends, but that is not actually what it always was. Um, it, there was a homestead out there in 1912. By 1914, there, were ho there was a hotel. Um, it's always been tourist. And three different hotels blew down in storms and got rebuilt on that location, but right there on the pass, looking out over the pass were hotels. In fact, the first plats were platted around the hotel, um, actually platted over top of it, never even really paying any attention to its location. But as the, the bridge and access changed, um, it, was, it was marketed on postcards and advertisements all over the world as a possible tourist holiday fishing um, village or location. And there were lots of um, data out there showing um, all the old pictures historically of you know groups of families and coming out to take fishing tours. And then of course, the commercial fleet came in along the pass as well and turned it into a commercial fishing um, location as well. So it's always been kind of a hopping place with lots of 
activity going on, very intense activity, and a mix of uses. And we want to make sure that um, it's clear in our documents that that's the case, and that we're not we're not when we talk about making it an activity center, we're not talking about turning it into something in the future that's more intense or different than it's always been. We just want to acknowledge um, what it is and kind of get credit for that and the support that goes with having a land use designation that's appropriate. So um, the, the other thing that we're going to make really um, clear in all of our documents is exactly our standing locally and how important it is that we maintain um, the support to the pass and the density and intensity that is that should be designated there. Um, the, you know, these are some of the rankings that came in. The, it's very interesting that when of Pinellas County tours, 39% come here to go to the beach. That's just huge, you know. Um, and so we come out number two, and then in the whole county, and then um, the um, family traveler, 40, almost 50% of all families coming to Pinellas County go to the beach at Madeira Beach. We are the number one family destination. Um, for affluent vi visitors, 40%, millennials, 40%, Gen X, 38, and, but apparently some of us boomers like it quieter someplace. I don't know <laughs> what that's about. But you can see how important that is to Pinellas County. And you'll note that um, when you start looking at, uh, I'll go back to this, but you start looking at the maps for the activity centers, um, there are activity centers all over the place that are overlaid on things that are much less intense and less populated and draw a, a, a smaller draw. It just makes no sense whatsoever why Giants Pass was ignored. In fact, when you go um, through that history, the one thing that I haven't put in there is that um, historically when your first comp plan was adopted here, um, Giants Pass was acknowledged by policy as an activity center. Now, at that time, there, there weren't any policies specifying what that meant, but it was acknowledged as an activity center, and that designation carried over in many of the comp plan amendments over the years. Somewhere in the middle um, 2010 range or right around there, for some reason, that policy came out. It was never acknowledged on the map as an activity center, um, but it's always been thought that way here locally. So what we had to look at is we know what um, the county currently has those areas designated. We've established that those are inappropriate designations, but we do need something that includes all of that in one designation that's consistent with the county. And so um, the, the activity center is the category that does that. Then we looked at what level of activity center we'd be looking for. We know that it's not a neighborhood center. Johns Pass does not serve the immediate neighborhood. Um, it's obviously serving the entire county, actually, the tourist draw from the entire county. But a major um, center would be way too intense for the small space and the only uh, one major road in and out of there. So we settled on the community center because it had the right um, um, density and the right floor area ratio at a 3.0 that would cover everything we've got and so that nothing becomes non-conforming. That was really important to us. We have some buildings out there, especially the residential that started as condos that are really intense given the size of their lot and, and have a really high density level. We want to make sure that nobody is made non-conforming and their rights or their property value potentially degraded by the um, designation that we choose. Wanted to talk a little bit about the floor area ratio because it can seem frightening that the county thinks we should be at a 0.55. Our plan calls us a 0.12, which is obviously still inadequate to cover what's out there. But um, and the designation we need for the community center is a point or a 3.0. That, that just kind of gives you an idea of the scale um, of what that means. Um, that, that can be very frightening if you don't have a sense of what can be built and how much green space you can still have. You know, you can have combinations in the middle of this. Usually in urban places, you don't keep, especially out here, you don't keep much open space on the ground. Things are a little bit closer in that uh, town center kind of development that you have down there. So it's something in between here. 
Um, to give you an idea what the 0.55 looks like, we want the community to understand this is 0.55 in Seminole. Does that look like anything you'd want John's Pass to look like? This is what they designated this for. It's entirely inappropriate. It's not even really um, urban. It's uh, highway sprawl, which we were all supposed to be eliminating as a policy and a development model from our plans starting in 1989. Why it's still in the counties as a suggested use, I do not know. This is another example, West Leland, 0.55. This is not John's Pass or any place else in, in the Deer Beach. So we did have two public meetings. One was for the businesses. I know that um, um, Commissioner or Vice Mayor Price was at that one. Uh, we had really um, energetic and um, open discussion. They were very supportive of the idea of coming in with something mixed use and supporting business density. We had another one that was a longer one throughout the, the uh, Saturday. People came in um, to, from the general public. We did do a main presentation and then broke up um, to the city center room so that people could get specific questions answered and sit down with staff members to, to, to get one-on-one -on -one input. And then we also did an online survey to collect public information and data. Um, and um, input from all of those meetings and those surveys guided where we went with the recommendation for the activity center designation. I showed this to you. I think you can see what the point was. It's just that the community center um, we're looking at is one of the small blue ones. We're not looking at anything um, like an urban or major center. We also wanted to give this map so that you understood that even Gulfport is low in impact as it was with given uh, that same community level activity center. So. Um, it's not necessarily things that are as intense as John's Pass, even smaller, lower intensity things fit into that category according to the county. Um, St. Pete Beach is even bigger because they designated the entire city basically all the way along the strip as activity center. Excuse me. Uh, yes. That's what we're talking about doing for Gulf Boulevard also, correct? No, at this point, Forward Pinellas had asked us to please separate the two because they thought it would be uh, set. We're going to follow directly upon that. Okay. What we're proposing actually along the corridor there is probably to give it the same designation we have on the beach side because it actually matches the counties and it gives us the density intensity we need and the mix without having to do a major defense over a long activity center and other kinds of impacts. There. So we just think it'll fit with the smaller lots there, but we'll be coming back and you'll be letting us know if that's acceptable. This is the um, Johns Pass Village Activity Center area. Now what we're proposing is the activity center be divided into character districts. That 3.0 is not appropriate everywhere in Johns Pass. We have some places that it has to be pretty high because like along um, the um, Village Boulevard, those, those buildings are built side to side, the whole lot's covered. In fact, they even extend out into public right away. And there are two stories. Some of them are like two and a half stories. So if anybody was to build back and try to build a three-story building there, they would need a, point, a 3.0 to do that. So it doesn't necessarily mean something huge. It sometimes just means on small lots, it's going to be three is as high as you can go. Um, but we are proposing that... Um, these various areas would have different characters, and I'll um, go over this a little bit with you. This is the traditional um, area within Johns Pass that we recommend being a traditional village designation with a 3.0, because as I said, these are side-by-side -side buildings with not a lot of space on the lots. Um, residential density of 25 units per acre, and temporary lodging of 70 units per acre, Although it, it seems like that's really high when you're looking at tiny little lots, it doesn't take much but a couple or four apartments on top to, to get up really high because these are nowhere close to one acre lots. The, uh, um, there's a commercial core area, which is obviously more intent. It includes the garage, Bubba Gumps, and Hooters and all of this down here, which was built at a actually much higher floor area ratio than our plan even allows. I'm not sure how that happened exactly, but um, it's there now. And um, all of these um, small lots are also really intense. Some have residential included. There's hotel rooms now in the 
um, garage, which is good because there's been all that unused space on the second floor for years. Um, and they're talking about on the smaller lots here, building like boutique hotel um, as well. And um, this also at the commercial core, we're recommending retail stores, restaurants, all of the usual mixed uses um, at a floor area ratio, of potentially 3.0. But in order to get that high, we're going to have all kinds of criteria that will be coming back as part of the special area plan. You'd have to get a PD and go through a very specific review. So it's not a given that you can just walk in and build this. There's still, a, you know, when you do an activity center, each of those districts is going to have very specific criteria. All that will come back to you at the same time any map change does so that they move through together and you, you know that everything is controlled and consistent with community standard. These, um, again, they sound high, but it's because the lots are, are small. Um, the boardwalk um, is extremely sensitive, as you can imagine. Um, and the, uh, we want to be able to continue the retail services restaurant and the commercial fishing along with the recreational fishing. It, it's an unusual mix that actually the county doesn't have any comparable land uses with both commercial and recreational fishing along with retail. So they have nothing in their plan that does this. So um, we're proposing one that has a floor area ratio of 1.5, um, no residential and no tourist accommodations on the, the past. We, that's not the right place for people to be staying because of safety reasons. Um, low intensity mixed use. We believe that we should include Pelican Lane in that residential. It's already designated for a um, R3, which sets it apart from the other um, residential in the back here along 129th, and it has to suffer with all of the difficulties of being part of that activity center, but it has none of the protections or design um, help or flexibility it needs to implement its current zoning. In fact, its land use and its zoning, as I think some of you know, don't match right now. We can't even use the current zoning because the land use um, is too restrictive and, and it was never, those two were never made compatible. So the hope here is that um, this will provide us with some design standards because we'll have specific standards for this character district for development there. I can tell you just that we have a number of uh, vacant lots here and um, we have been told that we're getting an application in for a, a number of um, actually additional single family homes that would be rental units. So we, we do need to maintain protection for these units back here. Um, this 1.5 just on those small lots gives them the opportunity for two story, maybe a three story typical home type development. And these are pretty typical to what they currently have in the R3. Their current land use doesn't support it with the R3 zoning does and they've assumed since that zoning was placed on them that they were able to use it but have not been able to. So Co John's past. Director Portel, yes. can I interrupt you mm -hmm. just a second? Mm -hmm. uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Mm -hmm. Now, those, the property that's back there, mm -hmm. that it, it is basically, a, no, no, that's just here. in black, yes. Yeah. Um, being as it borders the village itself, mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at across the street, you're looking at the back side of the village. Yeah. Is there any way to do that to where they're a little more flexible in what they can build back there? Well, for? yes. To actually, what we are calling it, uh, we're going to propose allowing um, a limited amount of retail services, restaurant, office, and things on the ground floor. Right now, because it's uh, it's in a zone, typically, if it's all residential, you'd think it's only going to be houses up off the ground. But actually, the R3 already allows them to have, uh, like I said, the land use doesn't support it, but the, the zoning that everybody assumed was allowed there over the years does already include the option for a, a low mixed use. So that was the intent, yes, okay, to give them because, more flexibility. Yeah, because it, the reality is, and I, you know, property around here sells. Oh, definitely. But, but we we also, to, when we come to back... look to, out your front door and look at the and dumpsters yeah. across the street. That does yes. also need to be cleaned up. And we have code enforcement and other design standard issues and also, you know, the opportunity when you have an activity center to maybe create a, an overriding 
neighborhood organization that can make some policy about our, you know, or actually you can be that, make some policy to deal with things like keeping the, consolidating the dumpsters or, you know, regulating deliveries and things like that. So it runs more smoothly and cleaner back there. But there's a lot of work to be done. Um, one of the things, too, that when we come back in terms of flexibility is that the design standards are going to address that height issue. One problem we have all over town is you can't get over three stories. And in for commercial development, it's virtually impossible to find any financing for a three-story building because it's just not usually going to work. On the other hand, you know, typically, uh, well, for years, people were, here were saying what five stories would be okay in our mix or commercial areas because that's considered acceptable pedestrian relationship. And But we can't do that right now. It, it's just not allowed by our code. So there ought to be some spaces where you're allowed to use the density and and get to some greater height than just the standard house. I mean, we actually have commercial districts that aren't allowed to go as high as houses. Um, in fact, uh, the boardwalk technically is all supposed to be one story. Um, if you remember, I just came back through and fixed that because it's all supposed to be one story. It's, it's been illegal for years. but who can operate with just a one-story building on the beach? Well, we're also looking at them ha having to, you know, unless they waterproof it. Yes. Yeah. Build up. So exactly. you're losing one story right there. So right. it's kind of, right. it, it makes no sense as valuable as the property is not to let them go up. So. Um, the resort area is, you know, a lot of times people think of this as being all condo, but in fact, most of our condos have gone the resort route and are now being operated as tourist um, entities. In fact, what that has done, and I think I warned you about this in the past, is our city population in the sentence went down actually significantly considering how small we are. Um, because of that, these are no longer used as and considered residential units, they're hotel units. So we have more tourists, but not as many residents, permanent residents. So we wanted to be able, these are more intense down here by John's Pass than they are uh, further up the beach and it needed to be designated as such and protected. Um, that, which is why we have a residential of 80 and a temporary lodging of 80. It's because we actually have a couple of buildings that have that. And in order to make sure everybody is conforming and covered, we wanted to make sure that number is actually reflective of what's in the district. Um, then we wanted to designate a transitional area that steps down from this more intense towards this um, area to the uh, north, which is um, again drops down noticeably in terms of its intensity. Um, and you know that this development here with the um, Madeira Bay is it's a pretty intense, definitely tourist oriented. I mean, there are condos there, townhomes being used, but they are side by side, and that's a very small piece of property. So the intensity here is pretty high. Um, so we needed to recognize that, um, and but it can be handled with uh, 1.5. It was all built under a 1.2 supposedly, but it's kind of teetering on the edge of too high for that. But the rest of this can be covered by the 1.5 at a residential density of 30 and temporary lodging of 60. We get everything covered. So we have included in here, and we will post all of this when you want to cruise through lots of data because that's what we do, um, talking about the difference between the residential and uh, the, the impacts and how they're measured. And, and giving you a, a summary of what actually comes out when you average this together. Um, the Johns Pass Village Activity Center standard compared to the countywide community center, what happens is their maximum would show up as 90, but it really averages out to only 37 units per acre over the entire district. Um, they go to 150, but the way we have it designated with the character districts, ours would average out at about 69. And um, they, go, they go as high as a 3.0, but it would average out to a 2.8. So you could see the character districts do have an effect on mediating the, uh, effect, the overall impact and making sure it's not all highly intense. 
Um, the traffic generation is interesting. We thought that we we're going to have to have a big traffic study, but it turns out we don't because under the current future land use and the county's plan, they would anticipate 8,674 um, general trips during the day, whereas um, because the activity centers are given 50% impact because they share trips, the retail and everybody in there is sharing trips, um, and that they only have to count 50% of their trips, um, which come out almost the same as the high end, but once you apply the 50% uh, ratio, it drops way down. So we have basically half the trip generation according to the county's um, impact statements for traffic. Now, when we talked to them, they, they wanted to know if we were gonna calculate that out at a full rate, and I said, no. We're going to use your rates. No, you can't ask us to do something nobody else is doing. So, so the answer which is no, in case the question comes up. <laughs> Transportation and pedestrian access. This is important because we've all been talking about this, and the possibility of a multimodal hub down here, changes to the traffic light, and also to access across the street, the pedestrian access from one side to the other. And there were things that we were talking about and put into the grant application. Remember, we had applied for a grant to that. Um, having the activity center designation supports our traffic change requests. And then those changes support having the activity center. That all goes hand in hand. And also it'll make us eligible for additional um, attention and funding for things like the beach trolley, increased services and things of that nature. So, in conclusion, we have uh, we know that we are a vital test, uh, tourist destination. The activity center designation would reflect better what we have existing and need for the future. It would be provide us with flexibility and more strategic planning and land development. And the activity center would implement our overlaid zoning districts. We will come back, as I said, with very detailed special area plan for it that controls for the impacts from one section to the next. Um, and um, this is a really uh, complicated process because of that. It's, uh, it's gonna take us four steps. The first is that we're gonna come back to you with a proposed land use change to the text, not the maps, but a category. We need to adopt an activity center category back into our plan and this time describe what it is. We need to use the county's, something that's consistent with the county's definition so that we are compliant with state law. And, um, but we just have to put it in the text before we can contemplate changing our maps to include John's Pass as that new district. So we, we are going to the Planning Commission with that proposal at their meeting next week. Can we define the density of our number in that stage? Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, we do. We, an outside maximum for floor area ratio, um, density and intensity. That it would be the 3.0, those higher numbers, but as you can see, they can't be implemented in every place as a higher. You just have to put your maximums in there. Um, and then we will also define in there that a special area plan will be created and talk about the, the differences in districts to some extent, just to make it clear that it's our, our type of activity center. Now, we won't be too specific because the activity center designation actually is um, on the county's plan is already on the town center. So it, it gives us a, an opportunity if we put the right definition in there to clean up our plans. We don't have to have a separate designation for down, the town center and John's Pass. We can clearly designate they're consistent with the county's plan as two separate activity centers. So when we come back with the complete plan um, uh, amendments and the map amendments later in a year or so, um, we'll, prob we'll ask to change that designation to put all those policies under activity center for the town center as well to clean that up. It's, it's a little messy right now. Um, so that's the first step. We will then adopt activity center plan, which means those special area plans that's a very detailed will come back. And at that time, we can initiate the land use map change. Um, and we will apply for the map change on the county's plan as well. So um, we have two different land things, land use processes going on. They're very extensive. If you will remember going through any kind of comprehensive planning in the past, you know, once we turn it in, 
the county and the state pretty much regulate how long it takes. It goes to all the agencies. We have to respond to all the various comments before we can come back to you with a set at, of, of policies and map changes. And then when we do that, we will have our hope and our plan is to also be writing the, um, the zoning because we have to change our LDRs to acknowledge all of this and it would be even more specificity than you have in the special area plan um, in order to get it into your zoning code. And we want to have that all ready together when things are adopted so it's not only cleaned up but you can actually use it. If we don't do something about the zoning then you, you can't really use it. So we want it all to be ready at the same time. It's, it's a very extensive process. Any questions? Have you got a timeline for when is when it's expected that all this will be accomplished? We, you know, we've been working. Um, uh, we're working and writing, and Dave Healy is working. He's really good about sitting in the room and saying, "No, it's just going to take longer than that." <laughs> when when I tell them that, they don't believe me. But um, it's a long process, and we think that. Um, we were thinking it's going to be fall before everything's finished, just because of the amount. Of, you know, there's 45 days for this and 45 days for that, um, but that's what it looks like. Our hope is to have our draft written and submitted to Forward Pinellas to work with the staff on the detail in mid-January. That's what we told them we were, were going to try to do. It, it's been tough because um, we didn't expect the schooner coming back, but it. It interrupted yeah. everything, and so we had to do a lot of writing, but we're, we're writing as fast as we can, and Dave's been a big help because he can kind of outline things and get us going in a direction, and then we can, you know, give us something to work from and kickstart things a little bit. So that's been helpful. Um, we really appreciate his input. Thank you. Well, we appreciate yours. Thank really, you for thank making you. that easy enough for me to even understand because... That is such a crazy situation we found ourselves in, and mm. I hope it's well under the way. So, you know, hurricane season is past us now, but I know. we need to be ready for next, you know, next year. So, great. I know they'll sleep a lot better when we have the land use and the zoning in place, and I know if something does happen, we can recover. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank when you. I read this. I got the feeling it was kind of a sales pitch instead of um, an impartial report. Right. And so that made me nervous. Oh, okay. Um, I hope this is an impartial portion and then mm -hmm. we get the staff recommendation and definitely your recommendations. Um, but if we made the FAR like 2.0, um, and then anything more than that, they have to come to mm -hmm. us. Um, one of the things you talked about was if we have a hurricane and the whole place gets washed away. Um, I th think we want to do something a little more special with that area, mm -hmm. or maybe eclectic is the, the where we want it to be, but we want it to be orderly eclectic, if that's possible? Well, it would have to be. If it all came back, it would have to be current code. And a lot of the stuff that's down there does not meet code. You know, building conditions and styles and drainage and, and other things like anybody who comes in with a new development is really going to have a heavy burden because they're going to have to replace utility systems and roadways. We're going to have to do geotechnical work to show that the roadbeds actually will hold the proposed development because those are locally, you know, locally built roads and don't necessarily have everything they need to hold big equipment, even much less a big building and all its delivery. So there's a lot of burden on anybody building anything big, but some of that would come even if it's small, if we're redeveloping meeting current standards is, is a lot tougher and would definitely result in a, a cleaner set. What we want to make sure is that it doesn't all come out looking like a mall. Um, you know, you, you want to be able to preserve that kind of village effect, at least in some of the areas. Um, and 
the the tight urban fabric that keeps people walking up and down the the sidewalks and keeps them there. Um, that that's the kind of thing we definitely want to reflect in the special area plan and in the zoning when it comes back to to protect the, the kind of the intensity of what goes on there from being not being too too intense, but also not dropping to the point that it doesn't sustain pedestrian activity and um, economic viability. Okay, so with a fire of 3.0, mm -hmm. the city still controls enough, has, will have enough input to, sure. to do what oh, absolutely. we want? Yes, the with the 3.0, is it's a high number. In most places, you'd, you'd be hard-pressed to get to it. And as the character districts had lower FARs, in those right. districts, you can't get to a 3. Those were the caps that we're proposing. And um, if in order to get to that, um, unless you're on a really small lot and you have a three-story building you're replacing, then it, that's a three. But um, if you're on a new development and you've got all the drainage requirements and everything else associated with development, um, it, it's going to take some work to get to that, and you're going to need to have a PD. Um, we also will be coming back with... Um, high recommendations and details for the character districts and the special area plan. So you, you, nobody needs to come in expecting to get to a three if they're in a character district and they've got not only a floor area ratio a cap, but a density cap and also a height, you know, maximum height to, to get, make sure you get it, keeping the scale of the district appropriate. It's, a, it's actually for an activity center, a very small area of land. So, the county is going to want to see that we've dealt with all of those details, and I think that the community will as well. And each parcel has to meet the regulations for that particular parcel? Yes. So if we build, um, if the hotel goes in, which is going to be uh, uh, taller and have more right. density and everything else, that doesn't get spread across the whole area that's just that parcel yes. and every other parcel uh, every, yes and and honestly uh that's up to them to prove i mean it, you know when they come in with a development plan it doesn't mean they're going to get it they've got to go through a pd process on top of all of this and you get to decide in the end what the design is how intense it is if you don't want it to be a three you can say why you know you can specify how high you think it should go and no higher so there's no givens there, this doesn't provide anybody a guarantee of anything they have planned. It does provide us as a city with the option to go high under certain careful circumstances, but there's no given. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. In terms of it being marketing, um, I, we're trying to model it on some of the more successful activity center applications that have gone through the county's process. It's one thing. Secondly, we're actually the applicant. <laughs> so we kind of are you know, marketing this to the county um, to, because we're trying to convince them that this is an important change to make in their comprehensive plan. And then we have to, it goes up to the state and we've got to convince them that we're really behind this. The community's behind it. We've collected the data. And yeah, we're, we're defending the position because we've done the data or we've done the research and done the work and it's based on very strong planning principles. And we'll be describing all that in the real document. There's a whole lot of paper to come. Mm -hmm. I don't have a question, but that was a fantastic presentation. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Yeah, it was. Thank you. Yep. Linda, before you leave, uh, I know you mentioned the schooner project. Mm -hmm. Can you just give the commission a, a time frame of when they might see the project and, sure. and you have your public hearings? We have uh, this... The schooner is scheduled for the Planning Commission next week uh, for its newest version of its PD. And so it'll be on your agenda in January and February, uh, unless you continue it. And then it could be on your agenda repeatedly, but that's, <laughs> the, plan that's the game plan now. The plan is one and two readings, yes. And the development uh, agreement will be following on that to be available at second reading. We're working with the attorneys on that as well. Thank you. Oh, hey, one last thing. I hear we're losing the Bank of America. Any idea what's going in there? Or oh no, nobody's said anything to me yet. Oh, I got a letter. You know anything? February, I think they're oh. pulling out. They, they have nobody's come in with a new plan. 
Okay. So I don't know. All right. Interesting. I'll try to track that down. Yeah, I don't know what they plan to do with it. No. Uh -uh. No longer going to be a Bank of America. So. Okay. I mean, that'd be nice to put something there that people would like to walk by. You know? Yes, that would be nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Any public comment? No. Next is update on Friends of Madeira Beach Parks and Recreation. Director Hatch. Well, uh, good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, first off, it sounds like we need a new bank for the nonprofit. Um, <laughs> that's news to us, but it, anyway. Um, so yes, I, I guess it was requested for an update for the organization. Um, so I'll kind of jump around a little bit and stop me if you have any questions. Uh, initially, so the, the group itself has formed uh, it does have its nonprofit status. We do have banking. Uh, we're working on a few other. Once you become a nonprofit, you get uh, discounts on certain services. Why? Whether it's design software or uh, QuickBooks or you know whatever whatever we use to track all that stuff. So we are still going through the process of that. But um, if you've noticed, we have begun events in John's Pass at the Bell Tower uh, final Friday. Uh, had the first and second of those two events kind of a terrible time of the year to start it with Black Friday and New Year's Eve, but uh, it's still being successful and they're gonna, they're, they're, their plan is to uh, power through that and make sure that people are aware and keep the momentum going. Uh, they do have a third final Friday, which is going to come up on December 31st, New Year's Eve. Uh, normally the event plan is to run it from 6 to 9 p.m., but this, this one we're specifically looking at more family friendly, doing like a sunset toast as the New Year's thing and then let everybody get off the roads before the, uh, the rookies come out. So, uh, that'll be from three to 6 PM. Uh, the toast to be a sunset. I think it's five forty eight PM. So that's kind of the idea. Put a DJ out there, play family friendly music, make it something that people can gather during the day while it's still light out and head home. Um, so that in mind, that's the first, um, you know, first set of events that the group is doing. Uh, and then take a step back. The reason for doing the events like this is to start the fundraising. Uh, obviously, donations are accepted for the nonprofit, but uh, whether it's sponsorships of the events, uh, we've got partnerships with the restaurants to donate some of the portions of their sales those evenings back to the group. Uh, so it's working out that we can all work together on that. Um, but with with that in mind, the, the group has gotten together for a couple meetings and, and set forth uh, really four slash five main goals uh, as we get started. Uh, one being the bell tower. Uh, if you've looked at it, it could use some love. So the idea is to ideally make it a little bit bigger. We do have a lot of events down there, especially the one this, this weekend, you know, the Christmas trees there. So we have the tree lighting every year, uh, Santa comes and then they've got the fishing tournament, and everything. Well, that group brings in a stage. So the idea is to turn the bell tower, not only into the bell tower that it is, but make it a little bit bigger and then make it a fully functional uh, like a community stage. So a gathering place down in the center of, of uh, John's Pass. So between these events and, and donations and everything else, sponsorships, the idea is to raise money for that and kind of get that going. So that's the first goal. The second goal is the dog park here. Uh, we do have some local business owners that are tied into uh, different types of dog businesses, whether it's groomers or boarding or whatever else that are interested in helping us and improving the dog park and making it something that not only uh, – is easier to maintain, but it's resilient throughout the years. So, you know, put some nice shade in there, put some artificial turf in there, make it something that we can, you know, be proud of, but also not have to work hard at to keep, you know, spending money and putting new grass in there and putting irrigation in there and something that can maintain its longevity. Uh, the third is um, raising money and looking at some entryway signs. Uh, there's some folks in the group that really like those signs at Archibald Park, the, those big columns. Um, so ideally is, is the group wants to help kind of build an identity for Madeira beach. People know when you're in town, Yeah, we've got the city limit signs, but, um, and I know in the past we had some signs designed by some engineering firm and it, they didn't come out nearly as, as Madeira beach as we thought they, they kind of would. So looking at this is they kind of want to look at potentially raising the money to do something similar to those in the entryways. Uh, those nice columns that say Madeira beach, they got the seal on them. Um, Great. but also, and again, that's going to be a worked out. Uh, workshop with the community in, in the long run and especially with uh, Linda and her folks and and each of these things that we do definitely working with community development is 
um, you know, they've, they've got to be tied into that plan as well. So uh, the fourth is help funding the trash pirates. Um, they, they've been spending a lot of money. They get donations. A lot of people want to donate so they can help buy the buckets and the pickers and everything else and make the trash pirates as successful as they have been. Um, so raising money through that arm is, is going to help fund them. And they, they, before they couldn't accept donations, they were just taking cash and going straight and paying for it and losing the tax and all that other stuff. So, uh, utilizing that to help them, uh, raise funds to be able to give people the resources to help clean up our beaches on a consistent basis as they have. And then, uh, the fifth is a fire department. Um, they've got, uh, you know, clover and equipment needs and all sorts of stuff. So, uh, ideally, uh, to be able to collect uh, funding and donations again through that and offset those costs to help with Clover and, you know, maybe eventually put together some sort of, um, you know, uh, what I'm trying to think, scholarship of some kind for other, you know, adopted animals or whatever else that, that would come out of the fire department. So there's a lot of different ideas with that. And then as these are achieved, the idea is to continue to, to roll those over into a new project. Um, and then have events in different places. The bell tower events, the idea is the money raised there will go towards stuff in John's Pass. Dog park events, which we're looking to start rolling now that we've got this going, those will fund the dog park. So it's it's one of those, you know, we, when we were starting this up and talking about Final Fridays, one of the biggest complaints, is, and it always goes back to parking somehow, but as the, the money's collected and we don't, they say they don't see it in John's Pass. So we're trying to make sure that that's not the same illusion as well again. So um, there are, you know, plenty of things that are done, but having them involved in the, in the you know, the, the business is tied in, uh, has been a real help with that. So, you know, keeping them happy and involved in everything else. So, uh, and one good example of that was we did the trick or treating in October on final Friday, and we actually had 45 businesses in John's pass sign up to participate, which was incredible. Mm -hmm. So with their help, I think a lot of this is going to be successful. So, um, beyond that, I mean, it's just, uh, continuing to, to fundraise, they will be helping out with Seafood Festival. Uh, they'll be, you know, whether it's through beverage sales or doing tickets or uh, helping out just for fundraising opportunities. And then they're looking at doing other events, potential beach party at Archibald for the Trash Pirates and, uh, you know, like I said, the dog events. So basically a little bit, and it helps offset us as well. Um, when we add special events to the fold of the Recreation Department, it, it is a, a squeeze on our staffing. So having a group of motivated residents and individuals that want to help us out is, is very very helpful. So, uh, and it brings stuff for folks to do. So and that was pretty much what I had to cover. I don't know if you guys had any specific questions beyond that. But I noticed something today, Jay, when mm -hmm. I was up at in inshores and that was, um, around where they have their Christmas tree mounted. They have the pavers with pets names in them. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if y'all had looked at maybe doing that over at the dog park or that, that has or been a discussion um I've, I've thrown it as an idea just as like test with people yeah. and I've, I've probably gotten 85 percent yeses that they would do that because you know i think it's a great idea so yeah because there, there were a ton of them there absolutely hmm. that's all i'll be done okay so the the pocket parts mm -hmm. uh, against the water and things um somebody I might have been Megan talked about that you guys have a plan or you had a plan for what the design for those could be um, and is, is that true and is that something that we can start on or is that something that the city could supply money or do to help get that done so that, that, it's funny, Megan actually is right here. Um, that's tied in, uh, Megan will answer some of the questions and then Linda has some information on that well. So it's kind of tied into a little bit of everything, but I will let them jump in. So with the pocket parks, the idea would to kind of make them look as uniform as possible, keep them green spaces, um, but also have you guys all seen the 133rd pocket park? Very basic, has pavers, a little area for a tree, very simple, very very easy to maintain, but pretty. So that was the idea. But we also have a few areas that use, one uses it for their driveway, so that would be a little bit different. You know, they're all different shapes and sizes. But if that's the idea and that's what we would like to move forward with, then we can start getting quotes together to achieve that. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking 
low maintenance is Absolutely. the number one goal, 100%. if possible? We need as low of maintenance as possible, anything that's native. And then Linda also has some information to add to that as well. Yeah, and we had also talked about possibly getting some companies to volunteer to, to adopt parks. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anything has happened on that or not. Not yet. No, okay. I was just going to add that um, they, the pocket parks are actually really important to us um, because they contribute dramatically to our CRS rating. We get almost all of our open space um, points because of the pocket park. So um, we, had, we were going to run a calculation to see how much impact it would have if they weren't functioning, um, if that was a contemplation, because it could actually end up increasing everybody's insurance rates because we get so many points from the open space. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there's the reason that places like St. Petersburg um, get away with high ratings and low requirements is they have parks and open spaces and areas that are not at high risk. But with the whole city being high risk in the floodplain, we really have to count on every little bit of green space or open space we, we can get credit for. So. We'll we'll run some kind of analysis. We're trying to figure out the numbers. I asked Jenny if she would whip that together, and she looked at me like she'd been good to your cut. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we, we had to, it takes a little counting, and they have a very um, arcane system of math that goes into all those calculations. Megan, I wanted to ask you on these little pocket park, park, parks, um, can people get married in them? You know, get married on the property there? Or would they rather not have that on the pocket park? Residents honestly wouldn't prefer that. They <laughs> um, don't want to really attract people to those areas. Um, some have even asked for us to remove benches because there's been a high problem with homeless people sleeping on the benches or very intoxicated. Um, so I would say that they would not be very fond of that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think that's got it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Any uh, public comment on that? Okay, next is beautification of Kitty Stewart Park restroom. You again. Hello, again. Um, I really just kind of need some direction. Um, do we want this trailer to blend? Do we want it to be a, a mural, a, a vehicle wrap? Um, Allie and I met with a local artist, and it was kind of, she was asking a lot of questions, but again, we don't have a lot of answers. Currently, it blends, um, but do we want it to pop? Uh, what are what are we looking for? I guess is my question. We have ideas, but I, I'd say pop because it's right now. It just looks like a a bathroom trailer, <laughs> like, a, like a latrine sitting on the beach. At least if we made it look pretty with a mural or a wrap or whatever, I don't know how an artist is going to. It's going to be a paint little on bit. there, but. It's going to be a little bit difficult, um, but we also have to remember vandalism. So anything that we do has to be able to be touched up in a sense. Um, we've got a lot of vandalism going on down at Johns Pass Park right now, uh, especially underneath the bridge and even in the bathrooms. So a mural or a vehicle wrap, um, it may be easier for a vehicle wrap, but if yeah. somebody cuts it, it'll be a little bit difficult to patch it. Right. And then we also have to follow our sign code. As to, I think as long as there's not any wording on there or it's very limited, then I think we could put something on there. Like a tiki hut? Picture? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we I'd all need to go down there individually the and seal? take a look. At Would you like to see the city seal on I mean, it? It's pretty. With, I, I mean, not the seal, but the logo. Uh, or, I mean, or the seal. I mean, I, I can try to visualize it. the thing. Um, I should have brought a picture of what it. No, looks no, like. no. I, I know what it looks like. I just, you know, maybe the seal on one side and the logo on the other. I mean, look at that. That's pretty. 
<laughs> well, if we were to do a vehicle wrap, we could we could do we could do anything we'd like. Um, basically, we just kind of pick a design and they print it and put it on. Why don't you price that? It's going to be expensive. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we got prices a few years ago because we wanted to wrap a few of our garbage trucks, and we were looking at about thirty five hundred dollars, and that wasn't even the whole truck. So we're I don't probably think that's so bad. We're probably looking at a few twenty five hundred to five grand, possibly depending on the extent of the. Yeah, because you're gonna have to go around all those mm-hmm. details. Right. Can you make it look like a sand dune? Probably. I mean, anything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> Since it's in the parking lot there, okay. Caddy, we got, we got nowhere to go. Or we could up. just remove it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And put back the pavilion. Oh. Yeah, since it's so in the parking we lot, we sold it with the bathrooms. Since it's in the parking lot there at Caddy's, is there any way you can kind of blend it into the, some of the colors of Caddy's? Well, somebody actually came to me in, with an idea today, and I didn't think it was terrible. If you look at one side of it and you see the buildings and the sunsets, you could actually, with a vehicle wrap, it's a picture, essentially, and then you could make it blend. But you're still going to have the tires and the plumbing because we can't cover oh, that's that okay. stuff up. Yeah. But it's possible. We could do it. You, well, if, if, if you want it to maybe blend, we, approach, we can well, make it blend gosh, in that sense. Backlash, if it's the caddies on it, if they wanted to put a wrap on it. Um. <laughs> I think if we if you want to keep it simple with the city seal, um, the logo depending it doesn't always fit very well depending on the colors or or whatnot. The seal is very easy to kind of work around, um, but we can get some ideas from. The seal is not going to beautify it that much. It will. It's. So I don't know if you've seen it color? in full color. Okay. In full color, yeah, it's very it's pretty. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, yeah. I, can I don't know go that we want to make it stand out. Maybe even we more don't than do a full does. wrap. Maybe we just have a huge decal made instead of the full wrap, where they have to come and install it. Yeah, we can. The we can do that. The wheel. Well, I mean, just something big to make some. You know, give us some advertisement and also make it look cool. <laughs> okay. Think. I don't know. I'm going to go down there and take a look at it. I think we need to come back to it. What's Maybe the- just give me some ideas, and then I can run with them. Um, I can I can show you what the city seal looks like on our staff shirts. We well, price them. a wrap and price a full a wrap. Of, yeah, okay. and then price a couple of seals. I mean, I think the people, same people that do the wrap will do a big decal. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. That way we can maybe cut it down to a third of the price or something. Okay. I think we the more we can make it invisible, the better. That's just <laughs> but, my thought. What? Paint it white like the sand or sand color? I mean it's it's a champagne color now. It does it does kind of blend. Um so that's what I'm you know. And the tires, they they make tire covers. They do or but they'll get vehicles. stolen. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Because they don't, there's no way to secure cut them. Or some on. plywood ones and paint them and fasten them there somehow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you may not have heard me earlier. I have a saw. <laughs> Are you going to build those for us, Mr. Mayor? Sure. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> We'd have to be able to move the thing. Otherwise yes, it does have to be mobile. Or keep sure. out of it, but we should right. <laughs> be able to pull it out. It's no big deal. Plywood, you know. <laughs> Are we really on this? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not really. All right. Thank you. We'll all, we'll all individually go down there and take a look at it. And yeah, and give me some then ideas. Then come back, you know. It yeah. doesn't need to be done if it's, no, if it's as simple as putting the seal on it, yeah. that's easy. Yeah, I just don't want, you know, do we really want another sign up? Well, and we have to be careful with Linda on that because of the sign code. We're only allowed yeah. so many square foot per the area of the property. Well, it's yeah. also letting people know that it's a public bathroom and to use it, you know, I don't know. They I know. think it's good it for Madeira Beach. It gets used a lot. Does it? It does. So good. Okay. okay. 
Yep. I'm putting it on my calendar. To okay. look at Kitty Stewart Park, right? No, no, that's okay. All right. Am I next? Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Any public comment on this? No? Okay, next item. Um, <laughs> wet zone declaration for John's Pass Village. Director Portel, I have to say, I think that's probably a great idea because <laughs> everybody's already doing it now. Sometimes it's best to just go ahead and acknowledge what's happening. That's, that's it. Yeah. Um, what we're, uh, like you said, people kind of do it anyway. Um, what I wanted to make clear was that, um, I don't think I hit the right button. I apologize. This is small. But the intent is um, not to expand everybody's alcohol license because the state gives them licenses just to right. distribute on their own property. So we'll just need to make that clear. You know, if people leave their their uh, business and they're carrying their own alcohol, that's fine. The, the idea would just be to allow them on the public right of way. Um, but not to do business out there. That's a whole other thing. For that, they have to get the temporary extension of right. premise and uh, temporary or an events license or things like that. So there's already stuff in place to regulate for that kind of activity, and it happens all the time for festivals and things. But this is just to make the streets a little bit more hospitable. <laughs> so, um, but what we're proposing um, is also coming up with a map for the area that that would apply to. Obviously, if we're going to have a wet zone, we need a, um, and we say John's Pass generally want to make it clear that doesn't give, we don't want them partying back into the residential areas. Um, we think that Pelican's already a little bit hard to maintain because it's the back end of those businesses and the front end is other people's houses. So that's not a great location to have people partying on the street. And um, so we're thinking Village Boulevard um, we we're a little concerned about the back side here because it's directly on Gulf Boulevard, and this is a Florida's got the highest rate of pedestrian accidents as it is. So we were suggesting Village Boulevard and then um, 129th um, up to Pelican, Fisherman's Alley, which is we know that not that wide, but um, that that could change, or we'll have to have some kind of language indicating that if it gets built over or something like that, we're not implying. Uh, alcohol, free alcohol inside of buildings or anything like that. Right. Um, boardwalk and um, also on the Johns Pass Boardwalk itself, and then the connecting Village Boulevard and um, Johns Way. Part of what part of this over here is actually uh, private property, and part of the um, the garage's site plan, as a matter of fact. So, so again, we just wanted to get your ideas. When you say zone, what yeah. were you thinking I, of? I would, for me, what you've got marked there is fine for a wet zone. I agree. Yeah, no, keep it off of Gulf Boulevard. I, I right. agree with that completely. Now, what do I mean? Are we allowed to just say? Okay. That is just, uh, we'll have to our... adopt an ordinance because we have one right now that says you can't do that. Okay. And then we'll specify in it that that's no implication of extended premise or right. So, so I'll come back with you to you with an ordinance. So, but the sheriff's department is they wouldn't factor into this decision or they've they've just sent me some policies I need to consider okay. that would need to be amended. They you know they know that. It, kind of happens now anyway, and they'd rather not have to arrest people for sure, sure. doing I, things yeah. they're doing I mean, anyway. Um, it, they do it in Treasure Island, um, and so it's not unusual within the area or with the sheriff in terms of managing. Yeah, Treasure Island, the whole city's a wet zone. Except the beach. Yeah, <laughs> which <laughs> makes sense. Which Absolutely no sense at all. And and our beach is a wet zone. Yeah. 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 Well, I, they they've asked me before why it's different there and here, and I I wasn't here when those were, decisions were made. But on the other hand, as I said, Florida is really bad with pedestrian car interaction, and you hear you know people who are drinking do dangerous things, um, or they're just not as responsible as normal all the time. 
And so there's more accidents associated with alcohol and pedestrians. That's why we want to keep it within the low intensity, low speed pedestrian area. Whereas on the other hand, you don't hear about as many people drowning off the beach because they were drinking beer. So um, it's safer to drink on the beach than it is on the streets, but we'll just, <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we keep it um, isolated and then the sheriffs know what they're dealing with. Yeah. yeah and I, you know, still public intoxication is against the law and we want to keep it family oriented, but I don't think, right. it, but I don't see a problem with people walking down the street with a beer glass of wine or whatever going up on the boardwalk with it so i say we move forward i do too okay i've got one you okay with it you have uh, madeira way which has bars and they're allowed to drink outside um i walk by there and every time i walk down it i pick up five or six drinking glasses bottles, empty bottles of beer, things like that. Um, they had somebody had swept together bottles of beers or bottles that had broken in front of the um, Cambria um, last week when I was there. Um, how do we, we're going to end up with more litter when we do this. Does anybody that walks out of the place with a drink is going to set it down somewhere or, or do something? So how do we keep the place clean? Already, it, it, there's a lot of litter in the village. Yeah. Um, one, it's enforcement because we've got ordinances in place. It's a $250 fine. If we don't have enforcement, we might as well not have the ordinances. But we've got a stack of garbage cans. If we need to put out a few more garbage cans, to be sure that's done because we've got <laughs> we've got all the cans that were along the beach. Me again. Uh, we're actually planning to switch over the garbage cans in the village to the toters. So there will be larger, and even though they're a larger quantity, we'll still have the same amount, if not more, which will make it easier for us to maintain the garbage down there. Also with birds, and they'll have lids and it'll be more aesthetically pleasing. But currently right now, I mean, in the village, we're down there every morning cleaning up garbage. So I don't necessarily think that this is going to impact it anymore, um, but we'll put out more garbage cans to try to alleviate as much as possible. And I do think people are already doing it in the village anyhow. Absolutely. So. Yeah, I think the only thing, you know, and this was a conversation we've had multiple times over the years, but I think, the problem is, and the difference is, there's a difference between somebody leaving Delosis, for example, with a beer in their hand, and somebody bringing a six pack down there and just walking around and just drinking. Um, you know, although I probably would be the person that would, would have supplied that six pack. <laughs> I, I shouldn't be talking against it, but we, we certainly don't want that element. We don't want a bunch of people just going down there and just partying in the streets. And it's just not, I don't, I don't think that's exactly what we're looking for. I think we're just basically acknowledging the fact that this has been happening for ever, uh, ever since we've been down there. And I would probably venture to guess that there is over the past five years, maybe three tickets have been written for anybody walking with a, with a beer in their hand. And the only reason they would write them a ticket is, if they're being unruly or in completely intoxicated or something along the line there, uh, one of our local yahoos. Um, but I, I, like I said, I don't think they've been enforcing it all that much. And especially with a family, somebody's walking around with kids and has a beer in their hand. I certainly have never seen anybody getting a ticket for anything along the line there. So we're just kind of acknowledging what's already been, been done. So I agree with Megan. I don't think the, the trash is going to be any more of an issue than it is, is currently. So. And the village closes down very early. I mean, See, most the sidewalks roll up pretty early there. That's for sure. Most businesses are done down there by nine or ten o'clock, so it's not going to be the same as other businesses that are open till three a.m. or two, whatever the time is. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Any public comment? Next is status of Court of Honor project at the city of Madeira Beach Patriot Park. Mr. Daniels. 
Yes, uh, just bring you up to date um, where we're at. We had a discussion probably four, six, maybe eight weeks ago when we were kind of you know looking at uh, you know having a fundraising event and and um, since that time it was suggested of working with some of our veterans groups to get more involved with it. And I did reach out to Pan Rasmussen, uh, and who have kind of has a handle on a lot of the veterans groups uh, through her work with the uh, Veterans Boat Parade and so forth. And she's agreed to spearhead uh, a group uh, from American Legion, VFW, Elks, uh, and of course her group uh, in you know, putting together, you know, working with the design, putting together fundraising events. And I'm going to, uh, she already has copies of everything that was done. Uh, Megan supplied that, that to her in reference to, uh, you know, the, the rough design that we have. And, and, um, and I'm also going to be introducing her to, uh, to Kevin Bowden, who had uh, volunteered to host a VIP event. Uh, to raise the funds for. So, um, you know, again, I'm not going to be here. It'll be one of those things that I'll be passing off, uh, you know, to Mr. Carson, but I do want to make sure that uh, Pam's set up for success and she seems very happy with, uh, you know, being able to do this. And uh, I think it'll be something that you all will be proud of. And I know uh, Commissioner Hodges is, this has been a wish of hers for, yeah. you know, three, four years, and I know the two years, two plus years I've been here. Um, so hopefully uh, I'll get an invite when you uh, do your grand opening. I'd love to come back and, and see how it turns out. Great. Thank you. And I, you know, and while we're on the subject, um, I was, I went to a function at the Elks Club a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking to me while they were there. And, I didn't realize it, but the Elks is actually one of the biggest contributors um, of funds to disabled veterans and whatnot. Uh, over the past 12 years, they've contributed, uh, I've forgotten the figure, but it, it was around 10 or $12 million. It was, it was a figure that was way up there. Oh. Uh, and I would like to see us in the next few months um, do a proclamation, maybe even have the three um, groups in the city come in for for a proclamation. Uh, that's the American Legion, the Elks, who does just as much as the American Legion does, and uh, the VFW. But but. Uh, the Elks has kind of been left out of their participation in in doing things for the city and for the community. So I'd like to show some recognition to that group too. But they all Absolutely. they all they all need to be recognized for what they do. Well, I was at that that dinner that night too, and um, just the atmosphere of the people down there. It's great. I mean, they're all so good. And I just really enjoyed the dinner, the company, everything was great. So yes, you scored some points. <laughs> I'll have that on my handoff list as well. To okay. the person. I guess that list is growing, so. Okay. Is there any public comment on this? I think if, oh, I just, does, okay. Um, I just wanna make a quick comment. Uh, Sunday, Rotary is gonna be having their pancake breakfast. And it's going to be at the Treasure Island Community Center in uh, Treasure Island. And it's going to be from 8 till noon. They're going to have pancakes, sausages, coffee, tea, juice. And then they also have a margarita grill set up. And I think in the past it was like $5. Bloody glass. Mary. I think it's Bloody Mary, not margarita. I wrote margaritas. Okay. okay. Bloody Mary. I've, I've gone <laughs> for the past, yeah, I don't know gonna, how many years. They're going to have so. that, right. So they're going to have that also. They're going to have a red sled outside. And if you want to, you can bring um unwrapped child's toy to put in there or food if you want to. But the breakfast is going to run about $5 a plate. And it's a good breakfast. 
It's uh, Robbie's from the Robbie's Pancake Place. He's the one that does all the, the pancakes. Which is now very Middle Grounds. Good. Very good. And actually, if you go in Middle Grounds and you look to the right as you go in the door, they still sell Robbie's Pancake Mix. Yeah. So. Yeah, they'll sell it there, too. No. Yeah. Okay. Has anyone else got anything? Okay. With that, this meeting is adjourned at 8.37 p.m.